we'll get started this morning. As our call to worship this morning, I'm going to start reading um, from the fourth uh, verse in chapter 21 of Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is one of the things we're looking forward to in heaven, having God right there with us, walking beside Jesus. His, his children being there together. I really like that no more crying or pain part of that. As I got old, as I get older, more pain. <laughs> as we get older, there's a lot. There's mourning also. We lose friends, we lose people that we know. Just think about that. Those things are going to pass away. We don't have to worry about that in heaven. All those things will be gone, and our new life will start with God in Christ. So it's beautiful. What? The writer there, John, wrote about Revelation. <coughs> Our opening song is To Canaan Land, I'm on my way. <coughs> to Canaan's land, I'm on my way, where the soul and never dies. My darkest night will turn to day, where the soul and never dies. No Yeah. 
pray with me. Thank you, Father, for uh, this first day of the week again. It seemed, they seem to come so often now. Time, the times are busy, uh, schedules are full, and Father, we want to make sure that on the very first day of the week that we remember you, that we think of you, that we worship you. And we pray, Father, that we can think and do all those things throughout the week. But Father, as we are here today, we're here to strengthen each other. We're here to help each other. We're here to praise you and worship you and remember your son who died. Father, the, uh, the, the world's a chaotic place. There's wars. There's always rumors of more wars. There's people that are needlessly hurt. And there are people that are ill, sick, and dying. Father, we, we look at all those things, but we also know that there's many blessings in life. There's uh, many joys. And Father, we're, we're on a journey to be with you after this life. And we pray, Father, that we would do our best uh, with that, that we would turn to you in all things, that as a nation we would turn to you, that as we make decisions, we would make the decisions you would be happy with. And Father, we pray that we would forgive each other as you've forgiven us. We pray that we would strengthen each other as you also edify us. And Father, we just pray that uh, we're thankful for the weather you've given us and for the uh, blessings in life and the strength and courage to continue through even the hard times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The next song is There's Power in the Blood. And normally we don't sing this song for the prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, but that's what we're going to do today. Think about that power that we receive through Jesus and what He's done for us and the sacrifice that He did for each and every one of us. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or he
Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, Jim. I'm going to read uh, Luke before I give the little speech here. It's uh, 22, 14 through 20. <clears throat> It says, when the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave the thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And I like to kind of elaborate a little bit on the things that I've been thinking about all week, in fact, probably most of my Christian life. Uh, what, did, what does that mean in remembrance of me? We know about the emblems, but what is the term in remembrance of me? Well, let's think about this. It's that on the day, on the eve of Jesus' just uh, degrade, degrade, degradation and Crucifixion, the Jewish people was observing the celebratory meal of the Passover, remembering God's fulfillment of His promise, commemorating their deliverance and freedom from the 400 years of bondage in Egypt. That's where Jesus was with His disciples. He was doing something that had happened 2,000 years before His presence. And we see Jesus commemorating, observing, and remembering what God has done. Simultaneously leading this concept to its completion as he reveals to his disciples that he is the fulfillment of the Passover. Just as the blood of a lamb covered the lentils and doorposts prior to the exodus from Egypt, The blood of Jesus covers the sins of the world for those who believe in him. You see the correlation? The blood is the symbol of life. And just as command, or just as Jesus uh, commanded that, as I read in Luke 22, 14, 20, there is obviously a transferred of the covenant from 4,000 years ago to 2,000 years later. Jesus made that promise that God has set before the church. And it becomes significant importance and cemented in the hearts of the early church. I'm going to explain to you where Paul was. Disciples who certainly observed this meal again in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, Paul is very clear and repeats it verbatim. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 23-26 through 26 and read what it says. For I have received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's amazing. Over 4,000 years, we get to participate in what happened during those times. We as Christians, because he gave the new name to us, to the Gentiles, the name of Christian. And they were first called Christians in Antioch. And it's amazing how today what Jesus did 2,000 years ago that 
we get to do it today. Still this day, we remember the hope and promises of God. Still this day, we are participating and commemorating the very words our Lord and Savior spoke so long ago. Do this in remembrance of me. That's where take our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your son. We know that he was in agony when he went and was crucified on the cross. But there was a purpose. It was your promise. So that we may live through him. So that our burdens may be carried through him and by him. And that we may be uplifted because of your promises and know that we have eternal life. So we recognize the body and we recognize this emblem we are taking today that represents his body and we also would be taking the blood which rep represents the new covenant and your promises that we will have eternal life for with you for eternity. So our prayer in your son's name. Father in heaven, we come unto you now, continuing our thanks to you for the death of your Son on the cross. We thank you, Father, for the blood that he shed that we might have that new covenant with you. Father, we thank, come unto you at this time, taking this emblem that represents that blood, and we thank you, Father, for his death and for what this represents in our daily life. In Christ's name we pray. opportunity this time to, to uh, from our hearts give what God gave us. He gave us his all. We can also give our all from the heart. Let us go to our Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you bestowed on us and that we want to share with those who are in need. And whatever we give, we give out of love. So our prayer in your son's name.
uh, today's lesson will be I will sing the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his love, the arms around me, drew me back. successful during his career. For three straight Olympics, uh, he, no, sorry, yeah, three straight Olympics, he held the title in the 100 meters, the 200 meters, and the 4 by 100 meters, except the, in the last Olympics, his team won the race, and it turned out one of the other members had been doping, so they lost that medal. But he was basically undefeated on the track in the three most important races in the Olympics for, for 12 years, uh, which is an incredibly long period of time to be successful, because sprinting is a young man's game. It gets harder and harder to do that the longer you do it. And it wasn't just that he was fast, it was he was so much faster than everybody else. I showed you this picture last last week. This is him in a 100 meter race near the end of the heat. Now this was not the final race in the Olympics. I don't think he would have done this in, in a final race. But, but you can actually see that a good, I don't know, that's probably five meters, seven meters before the end of the race, he has begun to slow down and look at his competitors because of how far behind them they all, the far, far, far behind him they all are. This is unheard of. In the, a, a hundred meter race takes place in a matter of seconds. To be this far ahead in a race of that short is unbelievable. And yet he is actually just, it's a game at that point to him because he's so far ahead. And, and knowing that he doesn't even have to win by very much, in fact, he could come in third and still get into the final race, probably influenced his willingness to look around like this. But to be that far ahead, is remarkable. And so at his best, he was so far beyond anybody else he was racing against, it was it was unbelievable. The last Olympics that he competed in was in 2016. And at the end of the 2016 season, 
after the Olympics were over and he'd run several, a number of other races in the World Championships and things like that, he announced that his intention was to retire at the end of 2017. So he was going to run for one more season. It was going to be kind of his victory tour. You get that sometimes with athletes who are particularly good. They will announce their retirement a year ahead or some period of time ahead so that they can go and run and people can see them run. And, and, and there's, an, there's an element of ego to it, but in, in fairness, you know, when, when people like, uh, I can remember going and seeing, one of the few basketball games I can ever remember going and seeing very dimly was the final year that Dr. J played. I went to a Phoenix Suns game with my, my, my dad. And I didn't know anything about basketball. I didn't know who that guy was, but I remember my dad telling me that that was something pretty special to get to see him in his final season. So, so there's a, there's a, a, a you know, there's a, an element of, of self-aggrandizement to it, but there's also an element of people want to see this. So, so he knows he was going to do that. So in 2017, he began. He, you know, he was right running again, and. In 2017, at the World Championships, he ran a race um, in the 100 meters, and it's a race that he was expected to win. And in that race, this happened. And you can actually see he is the man on your far right. And you can see on his face a very different look than the look he had when he was winning those Olympic races. I, I don't know how well you can all see it. Um, the, the screen doesn't necessarily help too much. But there is a look of, of fear and desperation on his face, and you can see why. If you look at the white line, uh, broken line across the track there in front of the races, you can see that there are multiple racers who are ahead of him in the race, and it's hard to catch up in 100 meters because of how short it is. On the other hand, on the far left, you can see a guy who's from the USA whose name is Gatlin on his, on his uh, jersey. And Gatlin has a very different look on his face. His look is determination. Um, he's not worried. He's not nervous. He's slightly behind one guy, but he is, he is not concerned. And sure enough, when the race ends, Gatlin wins by that much over Bolt. Bolt, remarkably, Bolt overtook every other runner in that race, even though he was significantly behind them at the midpoint. But nevertheless, Gatlin was just a little bit faster than him because he was out a little bit further, and, and, and the look on his face of determination was the look that carried him across the finish line. And the look of, the, of, of fear and the desperation got Bolt close, but not all the way there. And the interesting thing is, some of this is probably that toll of time thing. You know, you get older, it gets harder to run, but this is only one year after he beat everybody in the Olympics handily. And so you gotta wonder if maybe the decision to stop racing that he's already announced, this is my last year, I'm not going to race again after this. Does it matter once you decide to stop racing, does that impact how you continue to race even while you do? Once you know that you're not going to keep on doing this, that, that, that there's an end to it, does that change the way that you behave? And I think it did. I think that for, for Bolt, knowing that this was his year where he was just going around and kind of showing off for everybody, it wasn't about necessarily winning big or something like that. It affected how he trained. It affected how he ran. And it changed the, 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 the results as a, as a result of that as well. So, so we know that, that whatever the reason is, whether it's because we've kind of given up or whether it's because we're getting tired, we know that it gets harder and harder to run a race the longer we go. We saw last week this passage from Isaiah, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. And so the question I want to explore today is that when we're called to run a Christian race, and the Christian race is not a 100 meter sprint or 200 or you know, a kilometer or a few miles or even a marathon, the Christian race is a forever race. You run until you die. How do we run with endurance a race like that? How do we not stop? How do we get back up when we fall down? And you will fall down more than once. How do we keep going? How do we have that kind of endurance? And so that's what we want to explore today. And so today I've called this lesson the Eye of the Tiger. And, uh, and it's because it refers to, to a line actually from the Rocky movies. How many of you are not familiar with Rocky? I'm going to do it together. Let's see if anyone, I've never heard of Rocky before. Uh, so the Rocky movies, the original Rocky movie, was a... Was a um, what you call it, an underdog story. Rocky was this uh, this plucky fighter. He wasn't even really a boxer. He wasn't very good. He was just, he could really take a lot of punches. But he was this plucky fighter, and the champion, who's to, his back is to us, Apollo Creed, as a publicity stunt, offered a chance for one lucky fighter to get to come into the ring and go, I think, three rounds with him or something like that. And so, um, so this went out, and Rocky was the one who won the prize somehow. I forget how that exactly came about. But in the original fight that he has with Apollo Creed at the end of the first, at the end of the first movie, he fought him to a standstill. Now, because they both fell down, 
Um, Apollo retained his title because the tie goes to the, the guy who's got the title. But then in the second movie, they came back and the pressure was put on Apollo to fight him again, and eventually Rocky was able to defeat him in the second in the second movie. So Rocky becomes the champion. So it's this underdog story, and then it's this underdog ascends to the throne. But then after he ascends to the throne, we learn in Rocky III that his managers and his, his uh, well, his managers have been gradually scheduling him easier and easier opponents so that he can keep his title and so that he doesn't have to face someone who is like him, the way he was when he was younger, who really wanted it and was willing to, to put everything into it. And so he's become increasingly, not lazy, but increasingly lackadaisical about his training and about the effort he puts in. He's increasingly distracted by uh, gimmicks and promotions and things like that. And the result is that in Rocky III, he meets this guy. And this guy's actual name is Clubber Lang. And if you're named Clubber, you kind of have to be a boxer, I think. That or a mafia hitman or something like that, I guess. And, and, and the thing about Clubber is, Clubber is what Rocky was when he first fought Apollo. He's hungry. He wants it more. Uh, we use these phrases. You all know what those phrases mean in the context of an athletic contest without me having to tell you. And in the first fight he has against Rocky, he destroys him. He's brutal because, because Rocky's completely unprepared to go up against somebody with his ferocity and his drive. And the rest of Rocky III is Rocky regaining that drive, that eye of the tiger, that desire to win and to keep on fighting that he had before and he had lost, needs to get it back. And eventually he's able to defeat Clubber Lang and the, the, you know, he goes on to be the champion again. So the, the question is, we don't want to lose that desire. We don't want to lose that eye of the tiger or, dr or, or drive. And so the question is, how as Christians, when we're talking about a race that's going to last our entire lives, how do we maintain our urgency? How do we maintain our effort when it is a forever thing? And to do this today, what I'm going to do is we're going to actually go back and look at the same passage we did last week from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're just going to kind of look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. I've uh, italicized that lower part myself. So, so Paul says, and this is our first principle here, you run to win. Okay? You don't know, not to beat your fellow Christians. That's not, we can make the mistake of, of understanding Paul saying only one person wins to say, you know, that means that only one of us in this church today is going to win. And good luck, I'm going to take off now. You know? um, so it's not, that, that's not what he's saying at all. I mean, there's plenty of other things where Paul writes, and we, we can be sure that that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that there's a lot of other things that try to keep you from winning. Don't let those things keep you from winning. He's not saying run over your fellow Christians to get there. <laughs> you should never have to run over your fellow Christians to get there. In fact, running over your fellow Christians is a quick way not to get there, ironically. So we're going to talk about that later. But, but right now, just focus on this. You're running to win, not to win in the sense of getting there first, because getting there first would just mean dying fastest. The, the, it, the, you're running to win to overcome the things that want to keep you from winning. Back in the... Actually, it's really not back in the 90s. It's been for quite a long time now that the New York Jets have not been very good for some time. Um, I don't think that's a secret to anybody who follows the NFL. Um, and in many cases, they're so bad that within six or seven games of the season starting, they're, you know they're not going to win anything. And in, in back in the 90s, and I don't remember exactly what year this was, um, that was one of the seasons that they were having, where they, where they were about five or six games in, they lost a quarterback, they were terrible, and Herm Edwards, who was their coach, was asked whether they would start tanking. They, it was asked a little nicer than that, whether they'd basically start just, you know, not playing their best players and kind of thinking about the next season and not really necessarily focusing on winning, but focusing on draft position to get the highest possible draft by, you know, losing as many games as possible. And Herman Edwards was completely outraged by this concept. Now, management might have felt differently, but Herman Edwards, is, he got up there and he gave a press conference, and he was asked this question, and he said, he said, you play to win the game. You don't, you, don't, you don't work all week and put the pads on and the helmet on and go out there and smash into other people for an hour just to lose the game on purpose. You play to win the game. You don't work like that for nothing. And, and he was—he couldn't believe that somebody would ask him that. And, and yeah, you know, like I said, management might prefer that. But the simple fact is that the people who go out there, they don't go out there to lose. They go out there to win because that's what you're supposed to do. Similarly, you've got this guy. His name at the front of this is a guy named Mo Farah. And Mo Farah is one of the greatest distance runners, not marathon runners, but distance runners of all time. 
particularly he specialized in the 5,000 and 10,000 meter races, which are basically a little over three miles and a little over six miles. It's a long way to run, and they run a lot faster with manif marathon run. Yeah. They run at, this, at a speed that, that historically people might run the mile at. Um, and so Milt Farrow was really good. He was able to win both of those races in two different Olympics. Uh, in 2012 and 2016, he was successful in winning both of those races. And the thing about Bill Farrell was that he wasn't always at the front of the pack. He is in this case because it's easier to pick him out. But he wasn't always at the front of the pack. But he was always thinking about what he was going to do to win the race. And he was always running in a way to win the race. He wasn't necessarily running to outrun everybody else at the beginning or to be the fastest guy across the line of all time. But he was always thinking in terms of what do I have to do to win this race? And he was constantly doing it. And in 2016, he actually, in the 10,000 meter race, he was actually tripped and fell down and got up and still won the race because he was able to shape what he needed to do around what was left in the race. At those distances, you do have more of a chance. In the 1,000 meters, in the 1,100 meters, if you fall down, you're done. But in 1,000 meters, it, it's a different situation. So, so he was, or 10,000 meters, it's a different situation. So he was, he was I, I call him the maximum run guy because he would run these really long distances and he would put all of his effort into it over a long period of time but the whole time, his thought process is, how do I win? You know, what do I need to do to get past this guy? What do I need to do to get another 10 yards down the, the track? All of it was focused on how do I win? And Paul says that's the kind of mindset we have to have as Christians all the time. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, Straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He says, I am straining, I am pressing. There is this, the words he uses are the words of maximum effort, doing everything you can, because he identifies the value of the prize. And this is the thing, we don't just run to run, run, to run. you know. Our dog runs to run. She just, she gets so excited, she starts running around the house, and she's not going anywhere, except wherever I am trying to be sometimes, and that's always exciting, but she's not going anywhere, she's just running back and forth and jumping on things, she's so excited, and that's fun to watch, but it's not a particularly useful form of exertion, you know, it doesn't produce anything, it's just kind of this chaotic, you know, wind that's moving around, but, but Paul says, I'm doing this for a reason, I'm running to win the prize. And the prize is the thing we've got to remember. When, when, it, when it comes to endurance, part of endurance is being able to remember there's a reason I'm doing this. It's not just because I enjoy suffering. It's not just because I enjoy putting out effort. It's because I enjoy, because I want something bigger. And so Jesus says that the prize, the thing that we are straining for as Christians, is of infinite value. Over in Matthew chapter 13, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let me step aside as a lawyer for a moment and tell you that that's fraud. <laughs> you see that? If you were to encounter such a situation, I'm not allowed to do that. Anyway, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding a pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. He says these, there are singular things, not many things, but there are singular things that we discover that are of such value that we will give up everything else for that thing. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is the ultimate of that. The kingdom of heaven is more than anything else of that. It is, is infinitely valuable. And because of that, it is worth any effort that it might be required. Giving away, selling away, selling everything you have, giving up everything else you have, the kingdom of heaven is worth it because of the value that it carries with it. Because the kingdom of heaven isn't just part of being belonging to an organization in this life. The kingdom of heaven is about the next life and salvation forever. Life forever. Paul articulates it this way in Philippians. He says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Now, he says, I consider everything a loss. I mean, go on, actually. He says, I consider them rubbish, trash, garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Elsewhere, Paul will explain what all he considers rubbish. And it includes his heritage as a Jew, his citizenship as a Roman, his education 
as a Pharisee, the righteousness of law that he had followed. He actually says, according to the, to the works of the law, the rules of the law, I'm perfect. I'm a, I'm a really, really good guy, according to the rules of the law of Moses. But I don't consider any of that valuable. He says, I don't consider any of that valuable because what is valuable is the righteousness that comes by God and is by faith. Everything else is irrelevant. Everything else is trash. And anything else that I try to elevate to a level of significance like that is getting in the way of running that race. It's getting in the way of achieving that prize that is the ultimate value, which is that righteousness that comes by faith. And again, the salvation that that produces in this life and more so in the life to come. So we've got to remember the prize. We're running to win. We're not just running because we have to run. The second thing, Paul says, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. He's referring there to the Olympic Games or to the Roman version of those afterwards, uh, which I doubt any Christian would have uh, actually uh, been involved in because you had to be naked to do it. Um, but nevertheless, it was, it was a very popular sort of an event. Um, because it was, it, was, it was this level of academic, or of, academic of, of athletic achievement that goes along with this. He said, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. See, whatever, whatever game you run in, now many of the athletes at the time he was talking about would have been involved in all the different sports, all the different track and field type of sports, for example. But if you're a wrestler, you put all of your effort into maximizing your ability to wrestle. If you're a runner, you put it into running. If you are a, a, you know, a shot putter, you put it... And if, if you look at those three different people, they have very different body types and they develop their muscles very differently because it's all about succeeding in what they're doing. The only exception to that are the, the, uh, the decathlon and heptathlon athletes who train for multiple disciplines, but even then there's a lot of overlap. But they spend all their time getting ready for that, all their focus. And so the second principle we need to understand is that we have to train to succeed as Christians. We have to train to succeed. We don't just we don't just wing it, you know, hope things work out. We have a plan. Nobody shows up for a marathon for the first time, having never trained, never done anything, never done any running, and expects to win the marathon. I thought maybe they have been, but they're delusion. If you want to run the marathon, you've got to train. You're not even going to finish the marathon if you show up for a marathon and you haven't done anything to get ready for. Because it's 26 miles. That's a long way to run or even walk. And so you train to get ready for it. And as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised that we have to train ourselves, prepare ourselves to get ready. Now, on the one hand, we're already running the race. And you might say, well, what point is there a training when you're running the race? Well, you're training yourself to get better at it. You're training yourself to endure and to, to, to continue on and on. And so there is training that goes on even as we are running the race. Paul in 1 Timothy says physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we, put, we, that is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He says physical training has some value, and it does. Physical training can help us to live longer, it can help us to be more fit, and it can actually help us to discipline our minds, because the process of training, I'm going to talk about this a little more in a minute, is how we actually develop endurance, and that is as much a mind thing as it is a physical thing. But Paul says the ultimate value is in godliness, and godliness is a form of self-discipline and training as well. Godliness is about practicing the right thing. We talk about, um, in my field, we talk about the practice of law. The doctors talk about the practice of medicine. And there's always kind of a joke that we must not really know what we're doing if we're still practicing. Um, and there's probably a truth to that. But it's, also, it's also the recognition that whatever, however good you are as a doctor, however good you are as a lawyer, you can always learn more. And you can always be better. And as Christians, we need to think about godliness in those terms as well. That however godly we think we are, however good we, we have been, however much we are having success overcoming temptation, we can always be better. We can always improve on what we have right now. And so training ourselves to godliness, training ourselves through effort, is part of getting better at running the race and of, 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 of improving our ability to run the race. In James, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after having looked at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. If I were to ask you, 
if you were to all look directly at me for a moment, and I were to ask you, tell me, describe for me the outfit that you're wearing right now. How many of you are 100% sure you can tell me exactly what you've got on? What color your shirt is, your pants, your shoes, all of it. Some of you are raising your hands. Some of you are kind of thinking, more than likely, you know, probably. Because our clothes change, right? I mean, literally, I, I'm going to get home from church and I'm going to change into shorts because it's more comfortable, you know? Our clothes change on a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis. But if I were to ask you, how many of you can remember what you look like? I hope all of you would raise your hand. <laughs> yes, I know what I look like, you know? If I put you know, a line up in front of you with five faces, you go, that's me, you know? That's not a problem for us because we know who we look like. Interestingly, if you were to be put in a line of people who look very similar to you, you might actually have a hard time picking yourself up because you know what happens when you look at yourself in a mirror? You don't, you don't see yourself, you see yourself backwards. So there is kind of a weird side effect of that. But in, 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 in practice, though, we know what we look like, right? We don't always like what we look like. You know, you know my nose is too big or I'm too fat or whatever it is, but, but we don't always like it, but we know what we look like. And James says, if you, if you can't remember what you look like when you walk away from a mirror, something, you, you might not, you're wasting your time looking in a mirror, but something's wrong with you. And he says, if you're reading the word, the word is a do thing. It doesn't say, here's what you should feel and think. I mean, there's a part of that, but most of the word is go do these things. Love and care for people and show kindness and, you know, serve God. These are do things. If you're reading the word and it matters to you, then you should be doing the word because otherwise it's useless. Otherwise you didn't really even understand it in the first place. But James says the man who looks intently into the perfect law who gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. You want to succeed at being a Christian? Do you want to try to succeed? Look at the word and then go out and do what the word says. Keep practicing righteousness. Okay, so the third principle comes from the next part of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul says, Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not, not be disqualified. And we're going to talk about disqualification as a separate, as a separate lesson. Um, but I want to talk about this idea of disciplining our bodies and making them our slaves. And so our third principle is that we need to discipline ourselves to endurance. Discipline is what creates endurance. Doing something over and over again creates skill, but it also creates endurance, the ability to do it for a longer period of time, especially when that thing is something involving racing, running, swimming, something like that. When you look at the start of a marathon, this is the start, I believe, of the Boston Marathon a number of years ago now. There are tens of thousands of people in some cases, certainly thousands of people that start the marathon in New York and Boston and London, places like that, every, every race. When we look at this crowd, the truth is that if you look at this crowd, um, we know that not all of them have a legitimate chance of winning the marathon. In fact, not all of them have a legitimate chance of finishing the marathon, much less winning it. In fact, actually nobody in this crowd has a chance of winning the marathon, and you know why? It's because actually there, there's, a, there's a, a secret little thing that I don't want to talk about in the broadcast of the marathon, and that is that there are actually two groups in the marathon. There's a group that starts about, uh, I forget, somewhere between 10 to half an hour, 10 minutes to half an hour ahead of the rest of the group that are the people that are considered to be significant contenders for the marathon. And the reason why is because you don't want a bunch of these flakes over here running in the, around the guys who might actually win because one of these guys might knock them down or something like that and ruin the race for them. So we let all of the plebeians run the race on their own. They initially said this, the guys who really have a chance ahead, because those guys know how to not run into each other and not mess each other up. So, so this, is, this goes on in most major marathons. There are two groups. So these people literally, if one of these guys won the marathon, that would be awesome, because it would mean they'd run somebody down. It was like 10 to 30 minutes ahead of them in the race. But none of them are going to do that. Many of them are not going to finish the race. Many of them are just there just to try it and see, you know, to see what they can do. So at the start of the marathon, not everybody's going to finish it, and certainly not everybody's going to win, but we are called to endure. And the marathon is the race that requires the greatest endurance. But in our lives, if we're running a lifelong race, the level of endurance is astronomically higher. And so we have to train ourselves to endure. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, the Hebrew writer goes through and lists a whole bunch of different heroes, actually Hebrews chapter 11, a whole bunch of different heroes of faith. Abraham and Noah, David, 
uh, Gideon, and then some kind of outliers like Barak and Samson, who you wouldn't necessarily put Samson the heroes of faith category, heroes of strength maybe, but anyway, um, they, they're the Hebrew writer, I'll shut up. Um, so he says, all of these people have gone before us. All of these people have shown us what faith looks like. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, you can read that one or two ways. You can say, that means that they're all looking down on us, kind of cheering us on. Or you can say that they have witnessed the faith ahead of us, and therefore it gives us an impetus to run. And, and, and I don't really care which of those two perspectives you have. The point is that those who have gone before us serve as inspiration for us as we run. He says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the, thrust, yeah, the, right hand of the throne of God. He says, run with endurance the race, because our master endured. And this is a really important principle. We've seen this over and over again in, in the sermons that I preach. That, that when we are asked to do something, we're never asked to do it in the sense of, hey, here's a totally new thing I want you to try out. Nobody's ever done this before. Almost every time the scriptures say do something, they say do it because this is what God already did. Do it because this is what Christ already did. Do it because this is what people who went before you did. And in particular, we see over and over again our master, Christ, the Lord, did this. And if he's your Lord, then it's totally reasonable for him to ask you to do it too. Jesus explicitly says this to his apostles in uh, the latter part of the book of John when he's in the upper room with them. He says, I'm the master. You're doing what I say. So if I am humble, you need to be humble. If I am kind, you need to be kind. You need to be like me because I'm the master. I have the right to expect that of you. And so if, if Jesus endured, endured to the point of dying on a cross, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, humiliating, painful, agonizing death over hours, then surely we can endure this life. Especially considering that what we endure in this life is so much less than that. Especially as American Christians. So, how do we develop endurance? Well, unfortunately, developing endurance is a lot like developing patience. You know how you develop patience? You have things that you don't like happen, and you learn to be patient, and then more things that you don't like happen, so you can learn to be more patient and more. Well, endurance is the same way. Endurance goes, endurance goes like this. You have to have stuff that's really difficult, that challenges you, happen, and develop endurance, in which case more difficult things will happen that are challenging, and you will develop more endurance. And so it's not one of those things you want to pray for unless you're really serious about it. Because if you say, Lord, give me endurance, God might be like, well, okay, but, you know, you asked for it. So James says this, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James says, I know you don't like it when bad things happen to you, but bad things happen to you because they help you develop endurance. They train you to have a mindset of being able to keep on going even when things are difficult. And so these trials make you better because they shed away the things that are there that are in your way. Just like a runner who practices is shedding away pounds and shedding away all the things in their body that keep them from being able to run to their maximum capability, endurance gets rid of that stuff for us. And what's interesting is that humans are pretty unique among the creatures of this world in our ability to apply our mind to a physical task. Now animals, higher order animals, can think about what they want to do and then go do it. But, but humans have the ability to look beyond the thing of what we're doing and to think about bigger picture stuff and to use our brains to discipline ourselves to do stuff that most other animals can't do it. And one of the examples of this I came across in working on this series is what are called persistence hunters. Now, persistence hunters do not hunt the way that we do. The way that we hunt is we hide somewhere with a high-powered rifle and kill it when it goes by, or we sneak up on it. But for the most part, we hunt things at distance, um, at least when it comes to fast-moving animals. We hunt things at distance with rifles or maybe with a bow and arrow, but our bows and arrows are miles beyond the bow and arrow that they've got there. When you are using primitive bows and arrows and spears as your weapons, you cannot attack something from a long distance and have much hope of actually taking it down. So persistence hunters work in a very different way than most of the hunters in the, world, uh, the animal kingdom do. So most hunters in the animal kingdom um, are fast predators, cats and stuff like that. 
and they work by <coughs> being able to rapidly overtake their prey and catch it. And most of the things that they chase after are also fast. And so what happens typically is that a cat, for example, will try to catch a gazelle. And the question basically is, can the gazelle get away from the cat for more than a few seconds? Because if they can, the cat's going to run out of energy. Because the cat doesn't have that much energy, it can go really fast for a short period of time, but then it's done. The gazelle, if it can go a little bit longer, a little bit faster, it's okay. And once the cat stops chasing it, it's okay, it can slow back down again. But humans are different than those kinds of cats and stuff. We have the ability to operate with endurance. And so persistence hunters, what they will do is they will find an animal, and it will spook, and it will run off. But th those animals have been you know, trained by evolution and, and by experience. You run a little ways, and you can slow down again. And the persistence hunters can't keep up with the animal when it's sprinting, but they'll track it, and they'll just keep going, and they'll just keep running a marathon speed, just running and running and running. And the animal, when it sees them again, they'll sprint for a little while, and then they'll run out of energy again, and they'll stop. And they get a little bit closer, and they just keep running and running and running. And the animal sees them again, and it spooks, and it runs. But what happens is every time, the animal is getting weaker and tireder and less able to run, and the humans are just running and running and running. And eventually, the animal is going to run out of energy, and the humans are going to get up to it, and then those primitive weapons are more than enough to take care of. The only other animals, this is fascinating, the only other animals in all of creation that do this are wolves. And isn't it interesting that wolves will be adapted to dogs to be the ones that run with us when we do this kind of stuff? But that's just a little side note there. So the, the ability to develop that kind of thinking, to endure, and not just to run in little short spurts when something is bad and when something is necessary, <clears throat> this is key to being effective as a Christian. We have to be willing to chase after our goals, those infinitely valuable goals, with that kind of endurance that these hunters have even though they can be elusive, even though they can be down the road, even though it requires us to discipline ourselves past the immediate moment, that's what endurance is about. And the Hebrew writer says that sometimes this is hard to get to. Sometimes this takes a lot more than we'd like it to. The Hebrew writer says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. You have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. We sometimes bemoan how difficult life has become for Christians here in America. You know, it's it's so challenging. They don't they don't like us anymore. People keep saying bad things about us. And there are people in the government who are clearly not Christian and who want things that are other than us. And there's so many godless things happening in our society. And, and I think the Hebrew writer would probably have some pretty mean things to say to us. Maybe not mean, but some things we might need to hear. Because what we face in this country is so much. We still have tax breaks for giving money to the church. You know, we, we worship, worship here without the, without the slightest concern that the government is in any way going to molest us. In fact, it would be more difficult for them to shut this church down than any other business in the shopping center because of the protections that are afforded to churches under the law in this country. Yes, our, our nation has become less godly, godless in many respects. Yes, Christianity faces challenges and increasing levels of enmity from people in government and people in the world. But the simple fact is that what we face compared to what Christians in China or Thailand, or Laos, or in the former Soviet Union, what they face is child's play. But as Christians, we are supposed to face difficulties. Maybe not having to shed blood, but definitely having to face difficulties, because if we don't face difficulties, we're never going to develop endurance. You're just going to go along and think everything's great because you're a Christian, and when that happens, you lose sight of what's really what's good and what's bad, whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, because you don't have any way to compare. And that's the danger of being in a complacent situation as a Christian. So the Hebrew writer says, you, you have to remember that God wants us to be disciplined. He continues and he says, it is for discipline that you endure. And I would say, kind of goes the other way, it is because of discipline that you endure as well. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. We have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? In other words, if you aren't seeing the discipline of God in your life, that ought to make you nervous. Just as if you are, you know, if, if you're a child and your parents are suddenly like, just, yeah, whatever you want to do. That should make you worry. Maybe initially, cool, you know, I can do whatever I want to. But at some point, your brain ought to go, wait a minute, um, something's wrong if mom and dad aren't telling me what to do anymore. You know? And by the same token, if we're not experiencing any sort of difficulties, any sort of discipline from God in our lives, 
And that might suggest that God isn't really regarding us as children anymore. That we're so far off the, the, the ranch that he's just, you know, letting us go, which is what Paul says happens to those who are godless in Romans. So James, or Hebrews writer finishes the thought. He says, for they, our parents, disciplined us for a short time to see the best of them, but he disciplines us for our good. In other words, they had a short-term vision. God sees the big picture, and he knows what's best for us, so that we may share his holiness, our enduring discipline for holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. <coughs> we go through discipline, and we don't like it when we're going through discipline. The, the, the inherent nature of discipline is that it is imposing something unpleasant on a situation that otherwise would be more pleasant. But we go through discipline so that we can endure, so that we can learn what's right and wrong, so that we can make the right decision when things get even harder. That's why you train your kids to, to you know, how to make good choices before they have to make the good choices, or when it's a little thing, so that they can make the bigger choices when it's harder, when it's more important. That's why we do those things, and that's what God is doing for us as well. And the thing is, and this is the cool thing, as we develop discipline, it gets easier. It gets easier to develop more discipline, it gets easier to deal with the stuff that we have. It gets easier whether you're a runner, or whether you're, you know, whatever you do. I can remember, I, I, I've been shooting now for a number of years. And for a very long time, I had a really hard time being consistently accurate. I could shoot pretty well, but if you were shooting at a, you know, a target this big around, I was kind of all over the place at you know, five or ten yards even. It was just it was unpredictable. And I kept shooting and shooting and shooting. And one day, I, I, don't, I don't know if it, was, if it really shifted overnight or it was just something where I was getting better and I didn't really realize it. But all of a sudden, one day, everything went into this little bitty hole in the target. And it kept going into that little bitty hole. And I could pick up different guns, and as long as they were sighted improperly, everything went where it was supposed to go. And, and it was like it was like it, had, it was like a magical thing, but it was because I kept practicing. I kept doing it. And it's always fun. Anybody who shoots can tell you it's always fun to shoot. It kind of hurts, it's unpleasant. There's kind of a kick that goes along with it. But it can be tiring to shoot to be, to get yourself good at it. You just want to go out and blaze away with a gun, that's pretty easy. But if you want to get good at it, it takes a while. And that's true in everything we do, physically and also mentally. Mental efforts and spiritual efforts get easier when we practice and when we hit certain kind of points where it kind of starts to make sense. And one more thing, you go, aha, I get that now. And you do some more stuff, aha, I get that now. And it doesn't mean that the effort completely goes away, but it does get easier as we go along. And it gets easier to see why it's happening. So practice <laughs> It's easier. But the thing is, that requires discipline. It requires when we fall down, we have to keep getting up again. And we're going to fall down again, we're going to get up again. We're going to mess up, and we're going to have to make apologies, we're going to have to get up again. And we have to keep going, and keep failing, and keep trying, and keep being disciplined. And we have to accept that that's really going to happen, and that that's really for our good. And that's sometimes hard to accept, because we look around, and it seems like we're not making any headway. I'm still struggling. The world doesn't seem to be listening. This person I'm trying to convert isn't paying attention to me. It's frustrating. And it's difficult for us. But there is an end inside. There is a goal. And as long as we keep focused on that goal, then we can put up with all the difficulty. I came across a quote a while back from an athlete, a basketball player, that I think is one of the most profound quotes on this particular issue. And this guy said, he said, I've missed this is, a, this is a true loser, right? He, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. Kind of obsessive compulsive. He keeps track of how many shots he has. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeeded. As Michael Jordan said, arguably the greatest professional basketball player of all time, certainly the top three, and he said, I've done all the, I failed at all these things, but I keep doing it. And because I fail, that motivates me to do more. And because I fail and I get back up again, I get that much further down the road. And at the end of the day, now he has six championships. He's regarded as one of the best basketball players of all time. He is the, the whenever we, we get a new class of basketball players into the NBA, the question is always, who's going to be the next Jordan? Well, nobody is, it turns out. Over and over again, nobody's the next Jordan because Jordan was different. But Jordan understood that failure and, and persistence and endurance are what shape you into being good at what you do, being great at what you do. Because Jordan's ultimate goal was to win. 
was to dominate, was to, was to be the best. And his goal could only really be met by undergoing hardship, by putting himself through, by succeeding and failing and continuing on. And as Christians, our goal isn't just to be the best. Our goal isn't to dominate or win a basketball game. Our goal is to win a far more valuable prize than any of those things. In Philippians, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. He says, I want to know all this stuff that sounds so terrible. I want to know uh, participation in sufferings. I want to know that I want to become like him in his death. But he says, I do that because I want to know the power of his resurrection. You know what? You can only get to resurrection if what has happened first. You have to die to be resurrected. You can't live forever. You can't have everything go smoothly forever and expect to win, to achieve. You have to die to self. You have to die to sin. And in that way, we can attain the ultimate goal of resurrection from the dead. The ultimate goal of living in Christ. But only if we have endurance. Only if we're willing to run the race all the way to the end. Amen. Let's stand and sing. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, Because he first saw